second part of today's session, which is our EOT masterclass. So I am very pleased to be able to introduce colleagues from across um, the K3 Capital Group this morning. So first up, we have Holly Bedford, who's a Managing Director in K3 Tax Advisory. We've got Paul Hooper, who's a Managing Director in K3 Debt Advisory, and Quantumers Adrian Howells, who is a Director in Quantumers Corporate Finance Team. Um, in this EOT masterclass will take place over the course of the next 50 minutes or so. The team will explain what EOTs are, typical structures, and they'll be using a, a case study to bring to life some of the, the salient points. I think we have headlined this as, um, you know, under, under the banner, EOTs are great, but do come with a somewhat of a health warning for advisors out there um, speaking to their clients about these matters. So just as a reminder, we have got the Q&A function open. Um, do feel free to ask your questions as we go along and I'll I'll, I'll pick those up um, as we go with the relevant speaker. Um, we did have some questions in through the registration process and I believe that the majority of those Adrian's going to try and pick up in his, in his first session. So Adrian, I'm going to hand over to you and I think in the first instance you're going to talk about and just sort of give an overview of what EOTs are and the typical structures. Perfect. Thank you, Marie. Morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, some of you are likely to know what an EOT, an Employee Ownership Trust, is, but I'm going to um, cover this off uh, relatively swiftly anyway and pick up on the eight themes that you see on the slide here. Um, so announced as part of the 2014 Finance Act, Employee Ownership Trust EOTs are essentially a form of business structure where shares in a company are owned in a trust. Uh, for the benefit of the employees. Uh, the function of the legislation was to create an alternative method for owners to sell some or all of their business. And in very simple terms, it's the case that owners can create a trust uh, which purchases their business and doing so does come uh, with a great number of benefits. However, perhaps unsurprisingly, it isn't quite as simple um, as that, and we, we cover off a lot of that uh, in this session. Um, there are many benefits to sellers in, in doing this. So the transaction process is uh, much smoother and more collaborative um, than, uh, you know, maybe selling to private equity or to trade where, you know, parties could end up at loggerheads. And as the vendor, you remain very much in control of the process, including uh, to a large degree in terms of timing. Um, because, we are selling into the trust. Of course, there's no requirement to go hunting, um, some sort of lengthy buyer search and endless and often very boring um, management meetings. Um, the, the, the price uh, is set as, as, as part of this process. And so that is known to both sides throughout and therefore um, you know, no last minute price chips. Um, Due diligence requirements are reduced, uh, and so are um, warranty obligations on the vendors, which is helpful. And of course, uh, that also typically leads to lower overall transaction fees. Um, your legacy is is preserved, so you know it, it isn't all that common anymore. But it does still happen. You know, private equity or trade pick up the business and, and, you know, morph it into their own sort of vision and, you know, staff can can lose jobs and lots of stuff. So actually, you know, this business that you've, you've founded and maybe run for many years, legacy is preserved and your staff who maybe have helped you build this over many years, their, their sort of roles are protected. Um, I'm saving the headline benefit and the, 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 the one that most people are excited about until last, so long as you sell a majority of the shares uh, into into the trust, um, the transaction is entirely tax free, so no capital gains tax to be paid. Uh, clearly, that is a massive advantage versus um, other exit routes. It's important to note, however, that as the seller, you, you must lose sort of all control, both economic and voting. Um, but uh, it, that is not dissimilar to other exit um, options. Um, Many benefits to the business. There's not that many EOTs in the UK yet. I think the last count, which was about a year ago, to be fair, it was around 1,200. I suspect it's probably approaching 2,000 by now. Um, many more in the US, where they've done some studies there um, that show that these sorts of businesses enjoy some fairly distinct advantages. 
Um, so as well as providing a, a seamless um, succession solution, there's evidence that shows that because the employees ultimately stand to benefit from capital value, um, the business, they're that bit more engaged. Um, that leads to increased productivity and reduced employee um, turnover. And that in, in turn uh, leads to greater stability in the business itself. So and particularly in, in a downturn, such businesses um, have been demonstrated to be more resilient. If you think about it, the staff, although they don't own the business, the trust does, but you know, nevertheless, they stand to gain from the capital in the long run. If things are getting rocky, they're that bit more likely to grab an oar you know, and, and, and pull together to try and um, bring the business through uh, any sort of difficulties. Um, benefits of the staff. So yes, all they don't own it, but, but they you know, stand to benefit from it, but they don't have to put any money in up front. Um, as I say, yeah, in, in, the, in the long term, when it's sold, they stand to gain from the capital there. Um, and they're also entitled to an annual tax-free bonus of £3,600 at the moment. Um, it's worth noting there, though, that all staff, including any vendors who have remained on the payroll, must participate in that uh, in order for that to um, work. Um, so some positive indicators. So what, what sort of businesses might this particularly suit? Uh, it is genuinely a wide variety of businesses, but it, it, and it probably suits those that are you know, relatively well established, um, profitable, helpful if there's a really low staff churn, otherwise it just gets complicated in terms of who the beneficiaries of the trust are. Um, and it really helps because of the way these are funded, which we'll come on to in a moment, it, you know, uh, it really suits businesses that find themselves in a cash rich position. Um, it isn't for all businesses though, so despite these many advantages we've talked through, they're not a panacea. Um, so aside from being very complicated to structure correctly in order to benefit from the tax advantages, because, as I've said, the staff aren't putting money in to fund the acquisition. Actually, the funding is therefore driven largely by free cash on the balance sheet, any third party bank debt that you can get access to. Um, and therefore, in most instances, a very large slug of vendor loan note vendor debt. And that in itself will not appeal uh, to everyone and may, may rule them out. Um, it's got many qualification requirements, it's very stringent, um, and it is absolutely the case that not all businesses actually can um, partake in an EOT. Um, we're not proposing this workshop to cover those off in a great amount of detail just because there's so many um, hurdles and tripwires uh, as you go through this, but obviously we would welcome any uh, conversation with any Got clients considering um, an EOT to try and ascertain, look, could, could that work for them? Could it suit them? Um, important here, so very significant risks if we structure this incorrectly, and that, you know, ultimately is where good advice is absolutely essential. Um, the, the tests that must be met to make the EOT valid and indeed to make um, the, uh, to benefit, sorry, from the tax advantages, um, they must be met basically forever or until the trust um, sells its share. So that really poses problems and complexities um, when we're doing the structuring and a great deal of thought and effort goes into getting it right. So it's compliant in the first place and also compliant under various scenarios going forward. I really must emphasise this. If the tests have failed in the first approximately two years, it's on the sellers to then pay 100% of capital gains tax as if it had been a normal sale. And remember the way we've structured this, they may not have had much value out at that point in time. So I think it's fairly obvious there, um, the problems that that can cause. Um, onward sales, and we're sort of focusing on the difficulties here. I mean, they, they are designed you know, to, to have onward sales. Um, I mean, if you think about it, how else are the staff going to benefit from that potential capital value um, in the future? But it is not that advantageous. So on the sale, the trust itself must pay capital gains tax um, on, on the sale, and that's at a nil cost base as well. So that erodes in a lot of value in its, in its first place. The balance then is distributed to the employees, but it's done so as employment income. So, um, you know, again, more value is eroded in this, in this process. But I think the thing to um, keep in mind is that, of course, the employees haven't put any cash in in the first place. Um, 
the real challenge I think to pick up and, and we get this question or this sort of um, people exploring with this as an option quite a lot is if you want to sort of to sell quickly, you know, um, so I don't know, um, we'll, we'll sell into an EOT and I might only sell a small proportion you know, 51%, 55%, whatever into an EOT and maybe in three years time um, look to sort of spin it off either through an MBO or, um, you know, into a trade sale. Actually, this, this is particularly difficult because if you think about it up front, the, the, the trust is absolutely loaded with debt. And so any sort of, it takes a while to pay that debt down. So any sale within the first few years, actually the bulk of the consideration will go to servicing debt. And then of course, any remaining um, e equity owned by the vendors. Now the trust must act for the benefit of the employees. Um, and so, you know, if we're in a situation where you could sell it and the employee's gonna get next to nothing because um, of the debt burden, of course, you know, a trust isn't simply going to sign that off. So we, we tend to advise that um, because of this, that sellers sell a bit, quite a higher proportion into the trust. Otherwise, you can find yourself slightly marooned um, with shares that you can't shift for many um, years. So I hope that covers off what an EOT is and indeed why um, getting good advice is, is genuinely critical. I'll pass back to Marie. Thanks, Adrian. We have had just uh, one question in that I think I'll cover now, if that's OK. So Katie's asked, is, you referred to a bonus earlier on um, and, and that it was tax free. So Katie's question reads, is the bonus tax free for employees or is Nick payable? I believe it is entirely, it's entirely tax free for employees, but um, I will double check with Holly, who is our tax expert. Yeah, so it's tax free up to 3,600, but NIC is payable, which is kind of bizarre isn't it why they didn't just make the whole thing free of um, payroll deductions but that's the way they've done it so you still have to pay the ENIC. That's great thank you very much for that. Um, Holly we I, I, I mentioned in the sort of setting up of this session that we were going to base much of the session on on a, on a case study um, what I did fail to mention in, in the sort of thing the team up is that, that, that we deliberately have a multidisciplinary team on today and in um, the, the the recent EOTs that we've successfully completed, um, we, we found that sort of holistic approach to be absolutely invaluable. So Holly, over to you just to set the scene by way of the case study. Okay. So, um, yeah, we thought it would be really useful to run this session talking through a case study, which is actually a combination of some recent cases we've done um, where issues have come up, which we thought were quite interesting and what you wouldn't get on a sort of normal just run through of the rules. So uh, here we have this picture. Um, this group here is a long established trading group. They make flower pots. They've done really well through the uh, through the pandemic, you know, because more people have been buying nice flower pots for their garden. Um, you've got three subsidiaries in the group doing different varieties of uh, flower pots. <clears throat> so our shareholders are Mr. A and Mr. and Mrs. B um, in the two family groups, hold it equally, so 50-50. Um, they have a subsidiary A, subsidiary B, and B holds 80% of C. And in C, um, the two of the original shareholders, Bill and Ben, have retained 10% each, and they are also still directors of Company C. Um, B has Sybil's loans that it took out through COVID, the 500,000 that's still outstanding at this point in time. And the group does have a lot of employees. It's not, um, not by any means just a family company. Um, however, there are family members working in the business, which when we come on to the tax rules is really important. And it's something you need to sort of have a really good look at when you're starting an EOT project. Um, and just to say that company A that's in the group um, was bought into the group a few years ago from Jeff. Um, Jeff still works in the business. He's a really important director. You know, he's very critical to the success of the business. So he's still in the business. And also Jeff's son is a member of the senior management team. He's also a very important uh, member, of, member of the business. Um, so Mr. A is a director. Mr. B is a director. 
Mrs. B is in the business. Mr. A is a very understanding individual and uh, his ex-wife works in the business. Um, Mr. B is, is also very understanding because his stepmother works in the business uh, and his nephew works in the business. So um, all very genuine employees, no, no, no suggestion of just sticking people on the payroll. These are all valued employees in the business, um, but it does create some issues of tax, which we will go on to later. But um, I'll leave you first in the uh, in Adrian's tender care to discuss the um, you know the financial the the first step in in an EOT process which is looking at the numbers looking at the deal structure looking at the affordability so over to you Adrian to uh, talk about that part of it thank you very much Holly um yes our flower pot men um so they came to us um, as is the case with many um, uh, clients who end up going down an EOT route, actually didn't know what an EOT was, um, just wanted to interest in selling their business. And so typically then vendors are talking about, can I sell to trade? Um, can I um, sell to private equity? And, and so as, as ever, we sort of sit down and look at the group, look at the complexities of the group in this instance, and note also we've got the Sybils, um, bank debt in here as well under uh, B um, and uh, we sort of explore what may or may not work and reasonably early on we came to a conclusion partly um, because of the complexities of the structure and some dynamic within that partly because of the levels of the debt and also the although you know trading had gone really well during um, COVID actually before that it hadn't been so clever so we we worked out private equity wasn't going to be an option um, for them and took that off the table so we then left as far as they're concerned with the, with the sort of trade option but you know I, I sort of say this to any anyone working in an advisory if you're talking to someone looking to sell their business because of the advantages that an EOT brings certainly in terms of the tax at least and also as we sort of alluded to earlier some of the, the, the keeping the structure relatively straightforward Sorry, the transaction relatively straightforward. I think you know, with almost all vendors, you need to discuss what an EOT is and does it suit suit them. And so we started that conversation. But initially, um, the group was keen to sort of pursue trade, and we tried that, found some interested parties. But you know, as Holly said, sort of it's quite a conscientious group. The employees are important to them, and it was apparent for various reasons that the interested trade acquirers were likely to change the business quite a bit once they bought it and absorbed it. And the shareholders didn't like the look of this. And, and so obviously one of the other distinct advantages of an EOT came to the fore, which is that, you know, the staff sort of stay in situ as is. The business on day one after the transaction basically looks the same. So if you like, it's one of the key things that we we start off with, for, if you like, a corporate finance um, umbrella if you like is actually discussing what are your options does this suit you um and, and including whether you know, some of the some of the, the rules will be met which is where we engaged holly at this stage but i won't i won't cover off her bits just yet um so we concluded yeah we're going to go down the eot route so the next thing that we move on to we've had a couple of questions on this actually so uh, questions uh, the, the, the bit i'm coming on to next is the valuation of the eot so we've had a question is is, is evaluation of pre a prerequisite to an eot and um, who does it? So yes, absolutely fundamental. You must do evaluation. Um, where we are uh, transacting an EOT, we will do the valuation, um, but we do so on an independent basis. And um, the, the the methodologies we we tend to use. So we you know, there's, there's two that we tend to focus on. Um, most one is sort of just a, an, an earnings multiple the second where it's appropriate is to look at a sort of discounted cash flow um, model but actually for a lot of businesses particularly sort of smaller businesses forecasts aren't really that robust and credible and so a, a sort of a dcf doesn't quite work so in this instance it was a multiple um, valuation and that's sort of looking at what have other businesses similar to this sold for in the last few years um come up with a multiple and, and this we sort of valued at around 15 million pounds the important thing with the valuation is so two things one it doesn't although the entire structure gets signed off and the, the valuation is referenced um when this is signed off with hmrc the, the valuation isn't approved by hmrc so you might think okay well doesn't that lead to you know the vendors and of course with them we're sort of sort of working for the vendors to sort of go around and say well let's, let's absolutely ramp the price up as, as much as we can and and the, the simple answer to that is no it doesn't work a 
you know, just from an ethical perspective, we wouldn't do that. B, um, the valuation needs to be agreed, um, with, obviously, with us doing sort of, you know, doing our job properly with the sellers, but also importantly with the trust. And although I said earlier, there's not much of a diligence requirement. Um, but there is an element of, of advice that is given to the trust, particularly legal advice, and, and they, they must sign off on the valuations. If you've gone bonkers, it, you know, they're just not going to agree to it. So that, that's very early on that the valuation is agreed between all parties. Um, the other thing as well in terms of going mad with the valuation is, and this, this leads into the sort of the, the third bit here that we, we look at, is, is in the structuring. Uh, you know, the, one of the key things we look at is what is that, what, what works, what is affordable? Because if you if you if you over egg your valuation, you are then saddling the business with an inordinate amount of um, debt that you know it, it might take fifteen or twenty years to, to clear, and that, that just isn't going to work. So with with our our flower pot men group here, um, we reached a point where um, partly because of the existing civils, um, partly because of the um, attitude I think towards risk and debt on part of the vendors, we concluded that third party debt in this instance actually wasn't um, the appropriate um, route and so uh, it is it was sorry structured principally through vendor loan notes as an element of cash um, on, the, on the balance sheet that that comes out that comes out tax free and then we sort of structured it um, with vendor loan notes in this instance again just because of where the valuations were because actually the cash was quite a low proportion versus the overall value um, and again sort of the risk versus sort of nature of, of um, Mr A and, and the, you know the, the B family um, 55 percent of the business was sold into um, the trust because that then leaves less debt on the balance sheet for the business to service. Obviously, we, we did discuss at some length uh, the downsides that I'd alluded to earlier in terms of um, leaving um, too much, you know, keep keeping too much shares uh, in, in, in the business and that potentially being traps. But actually, you know, although that is a downside, actually, that the key thing there is more a timing point. I mean, ultimately, the debt is paid down and therefore the business can be sold. So I think, you know, so long as you, 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 you act as patient capital almost. Um, that it works. So that's that's what we, as the corporate finance team, um, brought in in you know in um, collaboration with with Holly and Tax, and also with uh, Paul Hooper in our um, debt uh, team. Who, although in this one we didn't put debt in, is going to talk to you now um, about uh, debt going into EOT. So I'm going to pass to you, Paul, if I may. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for sparing the time this morning. Um, I'm Paul. I work in the debt advisory uh, division of K3 Capital Group. Um, my role is to assist corporates in raising finance um, to enable EOTs to move forward. Um, by way of a, bit of a little bit of background about myself, I've been in finance for 30 odd years, far too long to even mention, to be fair. Um, and that's covered project finance, asset based lending and leverage finance. Um, there are a number of lenders in the UK that are familiar with EOTs, and that's across the leveraged finance market and the asset-based lending community. What they'll want to see is that the structure of the EOT has been put together correctly, and that all of the necessary sign-offs have been uh, done, done and carried out. In addition to this, what the really key, the key thing is, it's the same rules that any lender will have around serviceability of the debt, um, and they'll want to, and the, the key issue that Adrian has alluded to is they'll want to see their debt repaid primarily before any vendor loan notes or vendor finance, which in practice will mean that it can be some time before the shareholders actually get to see the full value of the business. In the case study that Adrian referred to, one of the key issues was the level of outstanding civils and bounce back loans. And the lenders that we spoke to about it wanted to see those rolled in to the new facility before allowing any cash out cash out in terms of the deal. What that meant was in this particular case, whilst we had some offers on the table, um, really the deal was done on, a, on the cash on, on the basis of cash on the balance sheet and vendor finance. Um, and that was the only way really we could at stage get to the, the sort of valuation that had been attributed to the business. So really, again, Adrian's mentioned it, the key for the shareholder is to get as much value out as possible on day one, um, because clearly under the EOT, with lenders coming in and wanting their the vendor finance loan, that their debt repaid before any vendor finance loans, it can take some time. 
I think the key message that I'd like to get across is that there is there is a real appetite in the lending market um, to support the OT structures, providing they have the confidence they've been structured correctly. Each of the lenders out there have their own drivers in terms of quantum and um, cost structures. And what we can do as part of K3, uh, K3 Debt Advisory is make sure we match the correct lender to the correct business. We have done a number of these um, over, the, over the course of the last 12 months. Not all of them have come to fruition, uh, again, in, in, in view of some of the issues that are around these civils and, and loans that are on the books. Um, but we have been able to provide debt structures to enable the EOT to be really looked at thoroughly. Um, I think that's probably all I've got to say about it. As I say, the key driver is there are lenders out there that are very familiar with all of this. They are, they are eager to put debt into these businesses, um, as I say, providing they've all been structured correctly, which is where my friend Holly comes in, who is the expert on all of these things. Thanks, Paul. <laughs> um, Marie, do we have the slide which shows the EOT structure? Just quickly. Yeah, so I'll just, I'll just quickly talk to this one because um, one of the issues, the sort of beginning issues that we often have to talk to people about is how, just how does this thing work? Um, just to say from the start, there are a ridiculous number of tax rules around EOTs. The basic sort of premise is quite simple, but when you get into it, look in TCGA um, tax people, th there are lots and lots of tests, lots of definitions that need to be considered when you're putting in the EOT and when you're running the EOT. Now, I don't plan to go through all of those today because it would just ruin your day before it even begun and it is Friday. But we are going to just focus on certain parts of our case study where it highlights some of the practical issues that can just pop up and kind of surprise you during the process. But just quickly, I'll just quickly talk about the structure. So this is after the EOT has been put in place. Um, we've got the parent company and the subsidiaries on the picture. Um, obviously, this is a simplified diagram from, from our flower pot uh, example. Um, we've got the EOT in this case holding 55%, which is what we did in our, um, in our case study. And the, the um, founders have retained 45% in that top company. Now, the way that uh, we usually um, put in place an EOT is an EOT is just a trust. So it's a kind of a legal fiction. Um, and the important body is the trustee or the trustees. And the usual way the, with the EOT is to use a corporate trustee. So that's to give um, limited life, liability protection. Um, so we form a trustee company and that becomes the corporate trustee of the EOT. Um, and the usual way to do that is to make it a subsidiary of the existing group. So it's within the group, it looks a little bit circular, but that's how it's generally done. Um, it, just a quick tax point. If you're thinking of using an EMI scheme for any uh, employees, you want to make sure that that company is company limited by shares, not by guarantee. Um, so what we have is that trustee company is the trustee of the EOT. And obviously that's just a company. So we still need some people. Um, and the people are the board of directors of the trustee company. Those are the people who will make the decisions of the EOT, taking into account the class of beneficiaries, which is the employees. They have to work in the, in the um, interest of the employees. So we've had um, a question already about board composition, which I'll kind of cover in the next bit that I'm going to talk about. <clears throat> so we said that the EOT has to have control. Um, and the sort of first step is, of course, it's got to hold the majority of the share capital. Um, but we have to look a bit deeper than that. They also have to have the majority of the votes, the majority of the rights to the assets, the majority of the rights to um, profits available to equity holders. And they have to have control over any changes that could happen to those tests above. Um, so we have to make sure that there aren't any funny share classes which might give, which might mean that they don't have the majority of all of those things. Um, so that's something to check to start with. You haven't got any funny share classes. Let's make sure that the EOT really does have control. And then going a further step beyond the sort of legal, you know, rights of the shares that the EOT holds. What about control in the kind of practical sense? 
like who is controlling this company. Uh, companies act through their board of directors. So we, we need to look at the boards. But this isn't really a sort of um, tied down in the legislation, but the revenue are interested in it. And I wouldn't be surprised if it's something that becomes more codified going forward, is that we always say your vendors are often in our cases, also the directors of the company coming into the EOT. And we say going forward, you should not control the board. So now we're talking about board members, not talking about shares, talking about members of the company board. We want the vendors to be in the minority <clears throat> on that board. So we're probably looking at bringing in new board members. Um, and then equally, the board of the trustee company, we don't want the vendors to control that board either because that's making decisions over the future of the company. So we don't want the vendors still having control post EOT. So again, we're gonna to have to think, well, who's gonna go on the trustee board? And this can be quite a practical point for, um, for, the, uh, for the vendors. Do they trust people? Uh, who do they trust? Who's, who's gonna make the right kind of decisions? You know, and so that, that needs a bit of thought. Um, you can have the vendors still stay on the company board. You can have the vendors on the trust board, but they shouldn't be controlling it. So you will need to bring in other parties that might be senior management. You might have the voice of the employees up on the, up on the trustee company board. You might decide to bring in a professional um, trustee, maybe an accountant, a lawyer or, you know, from a trustee company to to, um, you know, give that sort of third party feel. So let me, could we have my um, case study picture back up, please, Marie? So going back to our case study, um, we looked at this and to start with, we thought, yeah, this is great. We've got, to, <laughs> we've got a trading company. We've got, you know, really sensible, motivated shareholders who understand the principle of an EOT. They're, you know, they're in it for the right reasons. They're not just going into the tax benefits. They want to benefit their employees. You know, they want to kind of give back 50-50, um, brilliant. You know, so we haven't got too many shareholders to worry about. And then issues started popping out when we looked at this because of all the different people involved. We've got Bill and Ben, we've got all the uh, family members and we've got Jeff and his son as well. And so let me just quickly discuss connected persons because this comes into every test that you're looking at really, every important test in an EOT structure is who's connected. So we've got to look at anybody who's held 5% or more of the shares so note the five percent that's important because often where employees are given a small shareholding um, in a company they're often given five percent because of entrepreneurs relief so anybody who's five percent or more is caught by these um by these tests that we look at so we look at anybody who's been a five percent or more shareholder or five percent or more option holder and in some cases even loan note creditors and then we look at the people connected to them and connected in family terms. This is really complicated. So you look at your spouse and your relatives. Just hold on with the relatives for a second. We also look at your spouse's relatives. And then in your relative class, we look at their spouses as well. So you kind of have to draw these diagrams. And when I say spouse, it's also civil partner. Um, now the relatives, they're the normal suspects, your spouse, obviously, your, your um, ancestors and your lineal descendants, so grandparents, children, grandchildren, all of that. In this test is also brothers and sisters. They're not always in connected parties, but they are here. But really unusually, your aunt, your uncle, your nephew, your nieces, they are also included in the relative class. So we're also looking at their spouses and that relative class of your spouse so lots of people could be caught by this so we need to think about all of those people whenever we're applying tests and that's, that's quite relevant here <coughs> because we've got people holding more than five percent down bill and ben we had jeff who used to hold more than five percent got jeff's son so he's connected we've also got a stepmother we've got a nephew they're included the ex-wife is not included because she's no longer a spouse so She's not in this sort of connected party class, but with connected parties is a big thing. And you've got to be really careful when you're looking at the definitions to make sure you're, you're catching the right people. 
So um, the first thing I, I wanted to highlight is that you can have a company that you would otherwise think is great for an EOT and you can go, you know, racing down the path to an EOT and then you find out that actually they can't do an EOT. And that is because of something called a participator fraction, which is one of the tests that we have to look at. So getting a bit technical, we have to look at anyone who's had more than 5% of the shares in the previous 12 months and is still an employee and they're connected people. They can't be more than 40% of the total employee class. So if you have a company, which is a family company where lots of people are connected, or possibly you've got a company where they don't actually have a lot of employees. They have a lot of, say, contractors, people off payroll. So they have a lot of workers, but they don't have a lot of employees. You could find that that 40% test has failed. And if that's failed in the 12 months leading up to when you think you're going to do the EOT, you can't do an EOT. So something to look at really carefully before you go too far down the process. So that's my first warning, my first scary warning. So let's talk about who can benefit from an EOT. And again, this is something that people really need to understand when they're going into this. Um, this doesn't stop you doing an EOT, but it's quite important to, to understand, well, okay, if we put this EOT in place, who can eventually benefit from that? And what you can find is a lot of people can't benefit from it. And that's coming back to that excluded persons test. So really we're looking at people that have held shares and their connected persons. But in this case, we're looking back 10 years. So anybody who held shares in the 5% or more in the last 10 years is excluded. So you wanna be handling those conversations right with those people to find another way to make them feel better, maybe another way to incentivize them, but not, they can't benefit from the EOT. And when I say benefit from the EOT, this is really sort of a future sale or, um, I don't know, a liquidation, you know, when, when a load of money ends up in the EOT, these people can't share in that money. So in our um, case study here, again, we've got, you know, Jeff, his son, the family members, Bill and Ben, all of them cannot benefit from the EOT, which in this case has given, you know, some, some concerns because some of those people are, you know, valuable employees. And even if a share of the EOT is a bit down the road, it kind of feels wrong that they can't benefit from it. So we're having to think about other ways to incentivize and reward those people. Uh, and one just tiny little detail as well is when we say 5% of shares, 5% of any class of shares. So let's say you set up a special share class. Again, very common. Um, you know, your founders hold BAs. You want some employees to have some incentivization shares. You set up a B class. It's got restricted rights or something and give the employee options over the B class even if it's a tiny percentage of the overall shares, they've got more than 5% of the B class, they're excluded. So you have to just be really careful with these definitions. Adrian mentioned bonuses, which it kind of, uh, for most employees, this is the more the immediate benefit is that they can have these extra bonuses, 3,600 a year tax-free with NIC um, every year because it's a, group controlled by an EOT. Um, and this kind of flips on its head that whole idea that people are excluded because now the rules say everybody has to be included, everyone. Um, even those people, those bad people who used to be shareholders or the connected party employees, everybody's got to be included. And if they're not included, it fails the tests. The bonuses aren't tax free anymore. The only people that can be excluded is you can exclude people in their first 12 months of employment and people that are in disciplinary proceedings can be excluded. So, you know, but everybody else has to be under the scheme and the scheme has to operate in a way that everybody gets something. You can't end up with only five people out of 20 getting something that would fail the test as well. Everybody has to get something. The bonuses are paid by the companies, they're not paid by the trust. So company A will pay bonuses to its employees, company B to its, company C to its employees, or at least it would, but we have to check the tests in order to pay bonuses on each of the paying companies. And in our situation here, in Bill and Ben's company, company C, they got a lot of office holders 
not a lot of employees, they fail one of the bonus tests, the employees in that particular company can't get the tax-free bonus, but A and B employees can. So that's another you know, political point that might have to be handled within the group. So the important thing about the bonuses is um, and, uh, very similar tests in the EOT when it eventually comes to make capital distributions is um, the principle of equality. EOTs are not there to just benefit the top slice of employees. They're not there just to feed money to your stars. They are, it's about all of the employees. So you could play equal bonuses. You could just, A, could decide a bonus pool and split it between all of its employees equally. You could do that, that'd be fine. Uh, or you can differentiate to an extent, but there's only three ways you can differentiate. Um, you can differentiate on the basis of hours worked by your employees, their remuneration levels, or their years of service. So you can sort of say, well, people that have been here longer are gonna get more of the bonus pool than people who've only just arrived. You can exclude people who are in the first 12 months of service anyway. So each of those things can be used to differentiate the pool, but they have to be used kind of separately. A bit complicated to explain, I can explain that separately, but you can't sort of go, well, uh, first of all, we're gonna give 50% more to people with long years of service, and then we're gonna multiply it again for people that are paid more so each, each sort of each test has to be applied separately and everything added together at the end. So people say to us, OK, let, how are we going to define this bonus scheme? Everybody wants to know exactly what the bonus scheme is going to be before we go into this. So it's all going to be fair. You can't do that because there are some overriding tests. Every time you pay a bonus, you have to look at it. How is it falling out? How is, you know, using our normal model, how is it falling? Because you can't end up with the bonus pool going mainly to directors or to your highest paid employees or to one part of the business, which could easily happen just by accident. Let's say your warehouse workers happen to have been there forever and um, everybody else was part time. I don't know. It could end up that your warehouse workers are getting more than 50 percent of the bonus pool. They've got the main part of the bonus pool. Can't do that. So you need to be able to check every year that you're meeting all of the rules and adjust it and the other overriding thing to say is these bonuses cannot replace normal pay these have to be over and above what you already pay people if you start trying to use these tax-free bonuses to replace normal bonuses we'll say to people you know what we won't give you a pay rise this year we'll give you this tax-free bonus instead that breaks the rules so um it, that wouldn't fly. This, this is a benefit over and above everything else because it's an EOT control company. Now, I've been told that I'm running out of time. So I will just very quickly uh, say future sales. If the EOT sells its shares in future, like Adrian said, it will pay capital gains tax on its proceeds. Um, and the base cost is likely to be low because it's effectively inherited the base cost from, from A and Mr. A and the B family. That's often low in our scenarios. So they're going to pay quite a lot of tax, 20% under current rates on that. They have to pay off any outstanding debt to the vendors, all that. What they've got left is held for the eligible employees and can be paid to them as employment income. There are scenarios where, on quite an unusual Sort of sale in future, but it could happen. The way the trust deed works is there will be no eligible employees for you to pay that money to. The money gets trapped in the trust, and the only thing you can do is give it to charity. So I won't go into any detail because I've been told to stop, but be really, really careful before you agree to an onward sale of an EOT owned company. <laughs> Get some advice, otherwise you could end up with it all going to charity instead of your employees, which probably won't go down well. All right, Marie, I finished. Thank you very much, Holly. Um, thank you very much to you all. That was uh, extremely informative. And I, th I think what I've taken away from that is that there, there is a huge amount of sort of forward thinking to be doing before you get into sort of the EOT space. Um, thank you for the uh, the very efficient team in the background running this um, and flagging that we do have an awful lot of questions. So I'm just going to run through a selection of those um, whilst we still have a little bit of time. Um, we have a number which relate to um, 
the board of trustees. I, th I think broadly we've covered those. So I'm, I, whilst I will share all of the questions with the panelists and we can go back separately to those who asked to ensure that we have covered off those questions, I think I'm going to leave those. So Mark has asked, is there a 10 year charge on the trust? And I'll throw that open to anybody on the panel. Sorry, I've got a sticky mouse pad as well. Marie, it won't let me take my mute off very quickly. I believe not. I think right. it's IHT. We, as long as we keep on meeting all the tests, IHT doesn't happen. Yeah, okay, lovely. Um, Rebecca has asked, are you seeing offshore trustees being used for EOTs? Yes, we tend not to. Um, the, the advantage of having offshore trustees is that um, the trust, when it eventually sells the shares, is not subject to UK capital gains tax because it's presumably offshore in Jersey or somewhere where they don't have capital gains tax. But that's kind of seen as quite aggressive. And um, there's been rep representations made that really that ought to be stopped. It's not really in the spirit of what we're trying to do here. And also offshore trustees can be really expensive to, you know, just managing that offshore structure adds a layer of cost and complexity that most of our clients really aren't interested in. It might be different for maybe much bigger companies that are looking at doing this, but in general, we, we try and stay away from offshore trustees. Yeah, okay, fair enough, okay. Um, a couple of questions about connected persons. I, I think we have covered those and sort of, um, sort of some of those tests that need to be sort of met in terms of, um, you know, you know, relations and so on. So I think I'm going to leave those, but I, again, I will pass them on. A couple of questions that, that sort of centre around LLPs. So one of those questions reads, what if the business is an LLP? Can an EOT still be completed or will it have to convert to a company? I'm pretty sure it needs to go to a company first. Okay. It's a, it's, it's a sale of company shares. Yep. Okay, great. Um, and then I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to consider this the last question. So Josh has asked, what does an exit look like for the EOT or the shareholders and vendor shareholders if they retain equity? Could private equity own a business alongside an EOT? What does an exit look like for the EOT if they retain equity? So do you mean a partial sale by... So Zoom, Holly, it's... it's, it's sells, but the others don't, is that... <clears throat> Um, I've read it is we're selling the whole group. So we've only sold, let's say, 55% in the first place, but now 100% is being sold, but the vendors still own 45%. I may have misread the question, so apologies. But it, 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 in which case, you know, 100% of the consideration is split. 55% would go to the trust and 45% would go to the vendors, I think is. is yeah, so if, if we've got a, if we've got a EOT holding some, shareholders selling some, um, the shareholders that retain their shares, subject to the articles, could decide to sell their shares to other people. Yes, they're free to do that. Um, like I say, subject to the provisions of the articles about preemption rights and things like that. Could private equity own a business alongside an EOT? I don't see there's any reason why it couldn't in theory. No. There's no reason they'd want to, though. I think it's probably commercially, there's, it wouldn't make any sense, I think, for private equity, because they'll be in a minority position. They can't control when they exit. And if you could farm a private equity house that would do that kind of deal i'd be very interested yeah i mean we do see private equity holding minority interest but you know just minority interest but mm -hmm. um but i think their objectives would not match probably the objectives of the employees and the trust has to act in the interest of the employees so you probably wouldn't get a nice harmonious um position there that's great thank you um I, i'm conscious that i'm still seeing questions coming in um i'm, I'm gonna um, uh, draw a line under the questions now um, if the team in the background running this um, session would be kind enough just to take a copy of all of those questions what we'll do is we'll circulate them to the the panelists after this session and if we haven't come back to you and responded to your question individually we will come back to you following this session so just by way of wrap, wrap up um, thank you very much to you all for uh, joining us thank you for our speakers um, I think to summarise, EOTs can be brilliant, but they're not for the faint-hearted and there's an awful lot to think about. Um, so whether it's support on deciding the sale price, deciding on how much of the business to sell and the deal structure, sourcing external debt or tax advice and HMRC clearance, our multidisciplinary team are uh, experiencing successfully completing these EOT transactions. 
and we'll we'll instruct the chosen legal partner on setting up the EOT and producing the necessary legal documentation. Um, I think that pretty much draws a close to today's session and we're, we're broadly on time here, which is a great thank you to everybody that has attended. And th there's a couple of slides that are just sort of appearing on the screen now that, that have um, the speakers contact details on um, that, that appear throughout the session today. And, and I think all that all that I'm left to say is thank you very much again to all of those delegates that have joined us today. Um, and I hope you have a lovely long bank holiday weekend. Thanks.